is wonderful to see so many people here tonight. We, we have people literally hanging from the rafters. I like that. That doesn't happen very often. Uh, my name is Gary Young, and I am thrilled to welcome you to the first annual Morton Marcus Memorial Poetry Reading. It has been a year almost to the day since we lost Mort, and I keep expecting to see him walk in. He would have loved this. And, uh, with him sitting here, I feel like he's walked in. Um, last weekend, I was a guest on KOSP's Talk of the Bay. Uh, I read poems from Morton's last book, and we listened to recordings of him speaking. And after having spent so many hours over the years in that sound booth with Mort, uh, his presence was really palpable there. It was very, very odd to have the headphones on, sitting in the same seat where he and I had sat for uh, literally 25 years together, and I can really feel his presence here tonight. That shouldn't surprise anyone. For decades, Morton Marcus was a central locus, a catalyst, and the indefatigable engine of the vibrant cultural life that we enjoy here in Santa Cruz County. He left an enduring mark on our community as a teacher for 30 years here at Cabrillo College, as a novelist, as a memoirist, movie critic, literary critic, radio and television host, and of course, as a poet. The legacy I hold dearest is my memory of Mort as a husband, a father, and a friend. Morton knew how to live. He was a tireless advocate of poets and of poetry, and the effects of his generosity have left an indelible mark on the nation's poetic landscape. This is the inaugural Morton Marcus Memorial Poetry Reading, the first in a series that will bring eminent poets to our community annually. This series honors Mort's vision and carries on the work he began so many years ago, organizing poetry readings at Zachary's in the early 70s, which really kick-started the poetry scene here in Santa Cruz. Some of you, um, well, I know many of you remember that. He's inspired generations of poets at Cabrillo College and enthralling listeners on The Poetry Show, which is coincidentally the longest running radio program devoted to poetry in the nation. And dazzling, <laughs> yes. And dazzling readers with his own poetic gifts. Tonight's reading would not have been possible without the tireless work of a dedicated group of people, far too numerous to mention individually, but I do want to personally thank Morton's daughters, Jonna and Valerie, and his wife, Donna, for their vision and for their efforts to make this series a reality. I'd also like to thank our many sponsors, Owl Family Properties, Cabrillo College English Department, Cabrillo College, UC Santa Cruz, and all the good folks at Poetry Santa Cruz. There will, by the way, uh, be a collection for Poetry Santa Cruz, and I encourage you to support this very important organization. Tonight we are honored to have Robert Hass, two-term United States Poet Laureate, Pulitzer Prize, and National Book Award winner, inaugurate the series, and he'll come up shortly. But before Robert begins, Stephen Kessler, Joe Stroud, and I are going to read a few poems from Morton's final book, The Dark Figure in the Doorway, Last Poems. I would like to thank Dennis Maloney and his wife Elaine of White Pine Press for their really heroic efforts on this book. Many people in this audience uh, received frantic emails from Mort with drafts of poems in this book, written on the morning that he was racing to the hospital for surgery. Um, it was just an astonishing thing. He says, well, I may not make it, and I want you to take a look at this poem. Um, <laughs> but he was offered the blessing to finish his, his book, and he completed the final edits two days before he died. The dark figure in the doorway is a fitting capstone to a marvelous poetic career. 
Morton was mercurial, if not promiscuous, in the styles, subjects, and tones he incorporated into his work. Prose poems, lineated verse, short lyric, long narratives, dramatic, imagistic, personal, cosmic, humorous and serious, frequently at the same time, Morton Marcus contained multitudes, and the many facets of his genius are on display in this final volume. I'm going to start the program tonight with a poem called Forgiveness. It's in two parts. One, I heard the man before I saw him. He was kneeling in an alley off Broadway and 45th Street one summer night, rocking back and forth, muttering, forgive me, forgive me. At first I thought he was bending over a dog. Then I thought, no, his grief is too great. It must be a child. And I hurried to help. There was no dog, no child. The man was bending over his shadow, pleading with it, forgive me, forgive me. Two, she was my mother's friend, small and wistful. Her husband had been gassed at Auschwitz, and the numbers branded on her forearm were clearly visible. It was years before I could ask her about them. She smiled and touched my face. They are a sign, she said, that I have been forgiven. I read this poem on the radio the other night, and I can't resist reading it again. It's such a wonderful poem. It's entitled, Radio. For 65 years, I've waited to hear the words of God, expecting them to resonate from the heavens in a thunderclap over the planet, orations of approval or bellows of anger, like the words of a grandfather speaking to the head of a child. All that time I ignored or half listened to the radio that sits like a miniature cathedral on the living room table and from whose depths, muffled and staticky, come news reports of traffic congestion and foreign invasions, bulletins of airline crashes on snowy mountainsides, strikes at factories, sales at department stores, someone kicking a goal at the last second of play dance band music, shrieks of electrocuted guitars, terrorist bombing, and toothpaste brightening. These alternate with announcements of mastodons encased as if alive in blocks of ice, geese departing into sunsets, and oceans arriving like giggling girls tumbling their bodies into the arms of their lovers, hurricanes, famines, Politicians announcing their candidacy one day and declaring their takeover of the country the next. The announcer at Lakehurst in 1937 crying out as he watches the mooring zeppelin explode into flame. Oh, the humanity, or is it the horror, the horror? Now we beam radio signals deep into space, scanning the heavens in our solitary vigil for words that will redeem us. But there maybe is no redemption. And day after day, God is proclaiming the way of his world from the miniature cathedral in the living room. He had a way. This poem is called, I Have Lived Long Enough. One of the astonishingly good-natured end-of-life poems that Morton wrote. I have lived long enough to know that one day the earth will forget I am here and will turn from me as if I was a beggar hot and dusty from the road. I will be abandoned in a marketplace by the living who will have gone home to lunch, leaving me with the broken crates, orange rinds, and wilted lettuce. This does not disturb me. In a peculiar way, it excites me, making me enter each new day like a beggar in a story who limps onto the page from over a hill, 
bringing news of miracles in other lands, and asks only that the cities and skirted figures in his words remain with you in the marketplace when he is gone. One last small, wonderful poem, My Ambitions. I wanted to be many things, athlete, teacher, millionaire. <laughs> now I am content to be a cricket in the endless plains of the Buddha's palm. It is now my very great pleasure to introduce poet, novelist, journalist, and Harold Morton Landon Translation Award winner, my dear friend, Stephen Kessler. Hello. Um, as Gary said, uh, Mort wrote lots of different kinds of poems, so I'm going to read a a brief uh, sampling of the, some of the different modes. This poem is called New Year's Eve. <clears throat> it's gotten so I'm almost ashamed to write a funny poem. Even my wife upbraids me. In this day and age, things are too final. Each event is seasoned with our doom, like a roast heading inevitably toward the oven. Still, I can't stop laughing. All the terror, tragedy, injustice, wars, all the hatreds and jealousies that we first experienced in those caves dripping with shadows and paint-smeared walls are still around. And it seems that the only sanity is to laugh insanely. So understand this poet, or know that he'll stop laughing when the world becomes, as it's becoming, too funny for words. This is a poem that uh, is uh, evidence of Mort's uh, belief in the absolute creative power of the imagination. It's called My Andalusia. These are the evenings when the men in knickers stroll with saffron kerchiefs knotted behind their heads and vermilion garters like bouquets below their knees. Drinking from bottles or fingering flat guitars they appear at corners in groups of three or four, already talking too loudly, their embroidered vests unfasten, unfastened like casual breaths. They will walk all night, fitting their women into the shapes of their speech and sipping the flavors that float between their teeth. They pass drunken friends, boisterous nephews, with shirt fronts undone who swagger to dances, apprentices with faces of shadow stumbling toward rented rooms, and girls in butterfly dresses who sit patiently on porches. And always the women wonder where they are going, these men, these drunkards, as they clear away dishes and their young sons sleep with heroines like bent trees inside their dreams. The streets are infinite, circling like a black blood. The town is as large as the night, or the inside of your head. And if this never happened, compadre, it just did. The thing that gives that away as a, as a fictional uh, creation is the girls in butterfly dresses who sit patiently on porches. Because in, in Andalusia, they don't, there aren't any porches. There are, there are patios, <laughs> internal courtyards, and uh, that's where the girls would be sitting. But, you know, it's... it's uh, <laughs> As he says, if it never happened, it just did. So here's another uh, kind of Mort poem that combines his sort of uh, Taoist uh, perception of reality with, uh, with the local, local color and, uh, and, and nature. It's called Listening to Lou Harrison's Suite for Violin and American Gamelan Shortly After the Composer's Death. As I listen to Lou Harrison's Suite for Violin and American Gamelan, 
A blue jay in the oak tree outside the window shrieks and shrieks louder and louder, the same exclamation over and over again. I wrote that. I wrote that. I wrote that. <laughs> this is one of his, uh, this is a poem that reaches back to his uh, adolescence in New York. It's called Summer 1953. Summer 1953. If I can mop the lobby, clean the furnace, and roll the ash cans full of cinders to the street by 11.30, I can get off early. The pattern was always the same. Rush to the late night deli on 50th for a turkey on rye with Russian dressing. Munched on it as I strode to 52nd Street, then west eight blocks to Broadway and Birdland, paying the cover charge and flashing my false ID. Downstairs it was shadows and cool music. I'd sit at the bar, buy the musicians drinks on their breaks. Stan Getz, Sonny Stitt, others I've forgotten. Several times the prez, Lester Young, who nodded at all I said and sipped his beer, staring at the mirror behind the bar, thinking of music or misery, which by then may have been the same. Or I watched Billy Eckstein in a, in a duet try to feel up Sarah Vaughan, who gave him a resounding slap that was a pure note in perfect pitch, and Eckstein smiled. Once, sitting next to Miles Davis in his shades, I offered to buy him a beer, and without turning, he replied with quiet finality those words I've never forgotten. Fuck off, kid. <laughs> Birdland and Basin Street next door, Roseland Ballroom down the street with the driving rhythms and muted trumpets of maybe Woody Herman's big band, and the Palladium up the street where Perez Prado and Tito Puente blared their brass mambos and cha-cha-chas, until on those warm nights it seemed the street was made of music, a glass crescendo, a shower of sound that stippled the air and prickled the skin. The Buddha says, accept the house being torn down. House, no house, both are illusions. The poet says, remember those warm nights when music prickled your skin. Joe Stroud is one of the uh, best kept secrets in American poetry. Um, even in Santa Cruz, where he's lived for 40 some years and taught at Cabrillo for uh, 30 or so of those and is known to his students and other poets uh, as one of the preeminent uh, local bards and you know certainly of the bards of national reputation he's uh, he's he's one one who has managed to keep a very low profile and unlike his breast his best friend uh, Mort Marcus he was never uh, interested in being a public figure, or a priest, or a shaman, or a rabbi, or you know, any of those things. So he just has gone on very consistently with his work year after year and has produced a, a very uh, impressive body of work. He certainly has, to my mind, one of the best ears in contemporary poetry and uh, one of the most authentic voices. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Joe Stroud. Good evening. <clears throat> well, most people, when they first encounter a Mort Marcus poem, are immediately impressed with one of his strongest qualities as a poet, which is his immense, fertile, soaring, sometimes overreaching imagination. Um, <clears throat> only Mort could write a poem about having a picnic in the air a thousand feet above the Golden Gate Bridge and have you not doubt one line of it. Uh, to encounter his imagination in a poem 
is like watching a Saturn rocket take off from the launch pad with a million pounds of thrust. Uh, in a few moments, you will find yourself in the outer cosmos of Mort's immense imagination. But as has been said by Gary and Stephen, Mort wrote all kinds of poems. And when he chose to, he could write a poem very simply looking directly into something right there in front of his face, not off in the heavens somewhere. And that's the poem of his that I'm going to read tonight. It's the title poem of the book, The Dark Figure in the Doorway. It is, for me, the finest poem that Mort ever wrote. And it came to him late in life. It was one of the last poems. Uh, it's a poem about looking into a painting, a painting by Velázquez, Los Minas, one of the great masterpieces of Western art, and that is the painting on the cover of his book. The poem is about a subject that Mort spent a lifetime thinking about, and that is the relationship between the world of art, painting, music, poetry, film, the world of art, and the lives that we all live. The dark figure in the doorway. Wearing a silken silver gown, the little princess is staring at us from the foreground of the painting. As if on a stage, she is brightly lit, surrounded by dwarfs, ladies in waiting, and a recumbent hound. And she resembles a doll placed in the middle of her entourage. Behind her to the right, near a large canvas whose back is toward us, the painter Velasquez stands half in shadow, palette in one hand, brush in the other, while behind her, the princess is to the left. A nun leans toward a courtier, just about to speak. On the rear wall are paintings, large canvases, hang almost obscured by darkness, and a mirror reflects the presence of the king and queen who must be observing the scene from the same place we do, as if they or we are an audience at a formal family event. But no, the painter is standing in the wrong place to paint this scene. Do you see it now? It's the king and queen who are being painted, and the princess and her entourage are the audience, watching Mama and Papa pose for Senor Velasquez, a clever poi which confuses subject and viewer, since we are standing in the very spot the royal couple occupy and see what they do not what the painter possibly can. A postmodern bit of fun devised centuries before the modern age will have begun. That ruse, however, is not the reason I return to this 10-foot painting time and again. No, it's the doorway cut into the rear wall beside the mirror. Flooded with light, it illuminates a dark figure standing on the stairs. He is about to leave or enter. It's not clear which. He is half turned, looking back into the room toward us, or rather toward the king and queen. And it seems important, more important than anything in the picture, whether he is departing or arriving, as if the painting's meaning hinges on this point. I can't say why. Maybe because everyone depicted is so still, 
every object in its place. And the only tension is whether he leaves or enters from the world beyond the painting. He is the dark figure in the doorway, the one who imbues a work of art with meaning beyond itself. Even the painter and his clever ruse are less important than this messenger, this intermediary who carries the scene as witness between two worlds, the one created by the painter's skill and imagination, and the other what the viewer takes of it into his daily life. The little princess will marry the Emperor of Austria 10 years later, when she is 15, and will die at 22. The king and queen will leave a half-wit heir who will die soon after. And with them all, the Spanish Golden Age will sink into oblivion. But like the figure in the doorway, we hesitate today caught between yesterday and tomorrow, aware as never before that we stand with one foot in the painting and one foot out, sure only of this moment when we look into the room where the king and queen pose for the painter who stands with his back toward us, as do the doll-like princess in her entourage, and at our backs, we hear the laughter and curses on the street, while scattered around us like stars at night, where the sunlit dust motes of our afternoons are all those possibilities of who we were and could have been and one day might become. Well, it gives me great personal pleasure to introduce Robert Haas as the first poet to read in the Mort Marcus annual memorial reading. And I know Mort would be pleased and honored. For both Mort and I have been fans of Robert's work from the time we all met each other back in the mid-60s in San Francisco. That's almost half a century away. <laughs> uh, for both of us, Robert Hass's poetry through the years has set the standard for what poems might aspire to do. We all know now that Robert Haas is one of the most acclaimed American poets writing today. Uh, he is among an extremely select group to be awarded the Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Award, the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry, what in the poetry world we call the big three, <laughs> the best you can get. And what you don't know is that I know of only one other poet to have ever won all three. So there's two, the other one and Bob. Um, <laughs> If you want to know who the other one is, I'll tell you. I, I, I don't want to speak his name tonight. Uh, <clears throat> it's a poor down I'm careful. <clears throat> uh, the initials are J and A. Let me figure it out. Among other honors, he has been awarded a MacArthur Genius Grant, uh, and he was the Poet Laureate of the United States from 1995 to 1997. And he was a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets from 2001 until 2007. Robert Haas is also an extremely accomplished translator, having worked for decades in collaboration with the great Polish poet and Nobel Prize winner Czesław Miłosz in bringing those great poems from the Polish into an absolutely stunning English. And if you've never read Miłosz, you must get the Bob Hass translations. I mean, they're just, they're incredible. Uh, 
Amazing, amazing poems. And he's also made marvelous translations of the three great Japanese haiku poets, Basho, Busan, and Isa. So you get a sense of Robert's range from the expansive historical poems of the Polish poet Miłosz to those little diamond three-like three-line poems of the haiku of the of the haiku masters. I mean that's the kind of things that Bob can do. It's amazing. He is as well an acute literary critic. His collection of critical essays, 20th Century Pleasures, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for criticism. And he's the only poet that I know who has won that award for both poetry and criticism. Gives you a sense of the scope of, of his mind. When I think of Robert Hass's poetry, three things come immediately to my mind. First, his use of language, that peculiar quality, that texture of sound that distinguishes poetry from prose. Robert is the master of a lucid and graceful lyricism with an absolute clarity of imagery. He writes with a kind of casual sprezzatura, which is the ability of making the very difficult look easy. And it was for William Butler Yeats the sign of the highest craft that a poet can master, to make that really difficult stuff look like anyone can do it. As an example, uh, from time to time, Robert Haas, in the middle of a poem, will launch off into a two-page sentence, a sentence that's two pages long. And it's amazing to watch that sentence move from one line to the next, down to the next, and making these turns almost effortlessly. You don't even know that you've been suspended until you reach the end of the sentence. It's a, an incredible tour de force that he's able to do. Uh, I think it was Stanley Kunitz who said that reading a Haas poem is like wading into the ocean where the temperature of the water is exactly equal to the temperature of the air so that you don't even know you're in another element. That's how subtle he works on us. The second thing that comes to mind is his ability to meld the natural landscape with our human landscape. I know of no other American poet who writes so gracefully and engagingly about nature, particularly the world of our own Northern California, a place where Robert grew up and where he has spent almost his entire adult life. But he isn't just a nature writer, for the center of his world is human nature, the world of family, lovers, marriage, sorrow, desire, loss, divorce, the beauty of our lives, and its trials. And through all of it, there is an aching awareness of the evanescence of our time here. Third, what comes to mind is his keen intelligence, his deep knowledge of history, of science, politics, economics, and his willingness to engage in big subjects, something that a lot of poets don't like to do these days. In one of his books, he has a poem called State of the Planet. <laughs> it's a long poem. I wanted him to read it tonight, but I don't think he'll do it. Uh, uh, but think about the scale. State of the Planet. In his more recent poems, there is a real confrontation with the political world and the so-called business of war. Uh, and the body of his work creates a kind of gestalt of what it is to be human and alive in our unique time and place. And the last thing I want to say about Robert is that Seamus Haney, the great Irish poet, Nobel winner, talks about what poets do when they read other poets and he calls it the envy test. <laughs> He's reading, Seamus is reading a poem of Robert Frost, and he goes, ooh, that passes the envy test. <laughs> oh, I wish I had written that one. <laughs> a, good, a good book of poems will have two or three poems that pass the envy test. In Robert Haas's book, The Apple Trees at Alima is new and selected, there are dozens and dozens of poems that pass that test. And like my fellow poets, 
I am simply astonished. Tonight, we are all in for a real, real treat. It's my pleasure to welcome Robert Hess. Thank you. Uh, the sound is okay in the back? You can hear me? Uh, Joe, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> so you'll have to tell me later. <laughs> um, it's an enormous pleasure to be here. I need, first of all, to thank Jana and Valerie and Donna for inviting me and for uh, making it possible for me to be here. It's, uh, it's thrilling to read with um, Joe and with Stephen and with Gary and to be honoring uh, Mort and this community, this amazing community which I dropped in on from time to time and I feel like William Everson is here with us and George Hitchcock is here with us and Adrienne Rich is here with us, this entire amazing poetic community of, of Santa Cruz of, at which this, from the 70s on, Mort was always the center and, and vivid presence. Um, uh, one of the things that I, about his, his uh, power as a person, I think, and as a writer, got, gets into the dark figure in the doorway, it, it, in the restraint of that poem, which is in a way not typical <laughs> of him, but is, but is, but because, I mean, I think one of the things that made him so much fun to be with is that he wanted his appetite. He just wanted to possess everything. And I, and I always thought that his art was at its best when, when he was writing about um, uh, what he couldn't possess and letting it go. And in a way, that's what Doorway in the Dark is about. I mean, in a, in a way, and of course, the other thing that he was really interested in possessing and couldn't possess was Morton Marcus. <laughs> I remember when we were still quite young, Charlie Simic called me one time to say, guess what Mort's doing? And I said, what? He said, he's teaching a summer class at Santa Cruz on himself. <laughs> this, was, this was when we were young enough that that seemed real immodest. And I said, that's, that's wonderful. It's kind of typical in a way. And he said, you know what? I bet he starts the course with his baby pictures. And I... And I ran into Mort a few months later and I said, how did that course in yourself go? And he said, it was fantastic and I had this great idea. On the first day, I brought my baby pictures. <laughs> um, so I thought, without knowing what Joe is going to read, that I would read a couple of poems that I, of, from the last book that I think are particularly wonderful because of the way, and powerful because of the way in which they're characteristic and they get this thing in him. Um, and these are, uh, well, one of them is called What I Wanted from Women. I, actually, let me start with the other one first. It's called Before and After. After our breathing stilled and the slippery patina cooled on our skins, I imagined us lying side by side like two separate statues embedded in marble, as if we were half formed, never to emerge from rock. It hadn't been that way the moment before when we were one bucking against each other, fighting our separateness until it finally gave up for a moment and let us fall through each other's entangled arms. What are you thinking, I asked. Nothing, you replied. What is it I wanted words to say where words had no place, where knowing was not knowing? Like the vase by the open window that fell in a sudden gust, remember? Two green parakeets were painted on it amid scrolling red vines. We didn't hear it until it shattered. That vase we could not replace. I think it's an amazing poem. And, and, and uh, what are you thinking? 
this, in a way, Mort's most characteristic question in that way. So this is called What I Wanted From Women. What I wanted from women was the essence of who they were behind that face, deep in the heart, the person breathing from every cell. What are you thinking, I'd ask immediately after our breath stilled and our slippery bodies lay side by side. I couldn't see their faces in the dark, but in the light, their expressions didn't match what their words said. I'm not sure when I first realized the body lying next to me was not the shape of the other, but my shape. What are you thinking? I heard myself saying and knew whatever the answer, it would be my own. So it, it's a funny and a sad and a, it's a, anyway, it's a, a very mysterious poem. When, when I first met Mort, we were, we were all, we were all uh, trying to write shamanistic poems in the style of Merwin and Gary Snyder and, and, uh, and uh, uh, James Wright. So just for the fun of it, uh, because this is going to be, you know, I was thinking about it, I say it all the time, because I translate Japanese poetry and because the Japanese, by the time they started writing really great poems about the Japanese landscape, had been there for 2,000 years. And we've been in California in the English language for 150. Not even that long in Santa Cruz, <laughs> I think. Um, and uh, so we're just getting started here. And so a bunch of poems called Santa Cruz Mountain Poems, that's, that's a beginning. I did not buy the grass, nor the bush kneeling above it. What I own stops with these words and is enough. Yeah, obviously it wasn't enough or he would have been done right, <laughs> right there. It's enough except for the next 50 years of poems I'm gonna write. The wind knows it is water and the water knows it is rock fumbling among leaves and sunlight. Why am I the only presence entirely composed of wishes? <laughs> Dawn, the stones lean toward the sun. They rise from their haunches. From everywhere in the meadow, they drag themselves out of their weight, lifting together like an exhaled breath. So, Redwood, I finally know you. You're a tall bishop of dust whose arms extend in every direction to bless this earth. Leaves crackle under my steps like hands lifting my boots. They pass me from one leaf to another. A sliver of morning in the snail's museum. Damp hallways, empty and gray. The last one opens on a foggy shore where the sky encloses me and the sea is innumerable, whispers struggling to prostrate themselves at my feet. That's that, the, that's that version of himself, Prospero on the Pacific shore. <laughs> above the bin of grapefruit rinds and collapsed oranges, above the coffee grounds muddying the carrots, the eggshells, cutting lettuce leaves and onions above the gray beef bones and snowy hills of mold, the bearded flies are chanting their hymns. <laughs> he went from there to, um, uh, to po writing poems about his, among other things, his heritage as an as a Ashkenazi Jew. And, and uh, that belongs to this wonderful book, page from a scrapbook of immigrants. And uh, the mirror, is, it's almost a, a practice poem for a doorway, a dark figure in the doorway, I think. This same theme and question of, about possessing himself, called the mirror. The boy looks in the mirror often, not to view his face, but to look into the room that is now behind him. Coffee table, plum-colored easy chairs and couch, where the old man plucks threads from the golden throw pillow on his lap, and the boy's mother and father sit. 
It is, it is as though he stares into another room, a room where he has never been and is not known and can observe his mother glancing from her magazine to his father seated like a stranger in a railway car across from her. And the old man pulling at the pillow threads like a furious harpist who cannot sit still. And they remain that way until the boy turns around and is with them again, like a doctor entering the waiting room from an inner office door. It's, he has the Velazquez position in this, in this poem, and the same issue of, of possessing or not possessing our experience. comes that the tradition, and I think this gets two sides of, of, of self-portrait in a way. The holy ones. Beneath round black brims, above mouth and nose, the untrimmed beards bristle and sting. When the mouth inside talks or eats or mumbles prayers, the whole beard wags like a helmet visor that hides the head within that obscures the face of the one who would not be seen. With lips fluttering holy words, or in an excited squabble, easily startled, almost girlishly shy, the men who wear these beards scurry along the street in black overcoats down to their shoes, as if hurrying to get away, as if trying to vanish around every corner, always attempting to keep out of sight or go up in smoke or prayer or Kabbalistic innuendo. These are grandmothers, Jews, not grandfathers. They are timid, gentle, serene, with smoky eyes that look out at you as if from another room. The boy sees them on the street talking in clumps of two or three, beards bobbing, hands flying like doves around their heads. In the ghetto and the shtetl, their beards and black clothes are the customary dress of that holy class who would be close to God. But here, in midtown Manhattan, at the Diamond Mart, Jews in double-breasted business suits stare at them, shake their heads, and then walk on. When his grandfather sees him, he points and says, at getting a they, they put always good. At getting away from their wives, when they screamed, from their children, when they shouted, at getting away into books and prayers. And now in the diamond business, they are getting away with murder. <laughs> he grins, not angry really, and shakes his head with affectionate dismay. Uh, this theme of, of uh, not possessing his own experience and the hunger to, to possess it, uh, it was in the way he talked about music, it was in the way he talked about movies, and it was a thing he shared, I think, with Milos, Chesov Milos, the Polish poet whom I translated and whom Mort loved, and in the last years when um, we saw less of each other just because we were both busy in our separate universes that we often saw in one way or another when, when we got together around a reading by, by Chesov Milos. And uh, so I thought by way of transition, I, I'd read a couple of very late translations that I did with Milos um, of poems that he wrote just about the time of his 90th birthday. He had moved back to Krakow and we were, well, I'll read a, a note. In his last years, when he had moved back to Krakow, uh, we worked on the translation of his poems by email and phone. Around the time of his 90th birthday, he sent me a set of poems, which on some pages were entitled O, O, H, exclamation point, and on others, O, exclamation point. I wrote to ask him if he meant O, H, or O, and he asked me what I thought the difference was and said that perhaps we should talk on the phone. <laughs> on the phone, when he was rather deaf, I said, Chesov, which do you prefer? And he said, how do you hear them? 
and I explained that OH for me was a long breath of wonder. Oh, that the equivalent was possibly wow, and that O oh, exclamation, oh, was a caught breath of wonder and surprise, more like huh. And he said, after a pause, oh, for sure. <laughs> so here are the translations we made, and the first poem is called Oh. And the first line, I think you have to be 90 years old to write. Oh happiness to see an iris, the color of indigo as Ella's dress was once, and the delicate scent was like that of her skin. Oh, what a mumbling to describe an iris that was blooming when Ella did not exist, nor all our kingdoms, nor all our domains. 90 years old, not bad. There are, three more of, there are three more of these, and they're all based on paintings to follow on the theme of doorway in the dark, figure in the doorway, the dark figure in the doorway. And this is called, oh, Gustav Klimt, 1862, 1918, Judith Detail. And he notes that you can see this painting in the Osterische Galleria. And he has in mind those very early pre-World War I incredibly sexy, clipped paintings. Oh, lips half opened, eyes half closed, the rosy nipple of your unveiled nakedness, Judith, and they rushing forward in an attack with your image preserved in their memories, torn apart by bursts of artillery shell, falling down into pits, into putrefaction, Oh, the massive gold of your brocade, of your necklace with its row of precious stones, you doth for such a farewell. And the next one is, oh, Salvator Rosa, 1615-1673, landscape with figures, Yale University Museum. Rosa was one of the first people just to do a landscape. It's really kind of startling moment in the history of European painting that Asian painters had been painting landscapes with little human figures in it for a long time. Suddenly, suddenly around the 1640s, Europeans started doing it, seeing hu human life a different way. Oh, the quiet of water under the rocks in the yellow silence of the afternoon and flat white clouds reflected. Figures in the foreground dressing themselves after bathing. Figures on the other shore tiny and in their activities mysterious. Oh, most ordinary, taken from dailiness and elevated to a place like this earth and not like this earth. I always think about that poem because of he, he saw so much loss in his life, you know, growing up where he did, living through um, Poland in the war years, seeing whole cities leveled, seeing the Holocaust sweep through, seeing all, the, all of the people from his childhood of Lithuania hauled off to Siberia after the war because they had reactionary views about um, farm management. Oh, he, uh, I was driving up the Russian River one time and on an impulse stopped outside of Sebastopol at an old antique store and went over, as I do, to the bookshelf. And on the bookshelf, maybe halfway between Katadi and Sebastopol, was a large, thick volume in Polish, a history of women's underwear. <laughs> which, of course, I bought and brought back to him. And I've never seen him so happy. <laughs> and it was partly because he spent, here, here's the name for that, whatever the Polish version of camisole was, you know, here's the name for that thing. 
so, so to look at a landscape painting, what, 45 million by some estimates, 60 million if you count people who starved uh, dead in World War II. Oh, most ordinary, taken from dailiness and elevated to a place like this earth and not like this earth. The last one you will all recognize, oh, Edward Hopper, 1882-1967, Hotel Room. Thyssen Collection in Madrid, directly across the street from the place where you'd see that Velasquez painting at the Prado. Oh, what sadness, unaware that it's sadness, what despair that doesn't know it's despair. A businesswoman, her unpacked suitcase on the floor, sits on a bed half undressed in red underwear, her hair impeccable. She has a piece of paper in her hand, probably with numbers. Who are you? Nobody will ask. She doesn't know either. So, Cheslav Miłosz at age 90. So I thought I would read a little bit from a sequence of poems that involves an elegy to Cheslav. I've been, um, I've fallen into the practice of keeping monthly notebooks. So I just set aside my October notebook and, and then took, now I have my November notebook and I, and I don't know what final shape they'll take, but one of the things I discovered when it happened was, once I started doing it, by the second year I noticed that every June I was writing to some extent about the same things and every July, so it would take on themes. So this is at the moment called July Notebook, The Birds, because it's full of bird imagery. I'll read a little from it. Begins, sleep like the down elevator's imitation of a memory lapse. Then early light. Why were you born, Voyager? One is not born for a reason, though there is a skein of causes. Out of yellowish froth, cells begin to divide, or so they say, and feed on sunlight for no reason. After that, life wants life. You're awake now? I'm awake now. In front of me, six African men, each of them tall and handsome, all of them impeccably tailored. All six order Coca-Cola at dinner, Muslim it seems, a trade delegation, diplomats. The young American girl next to me is a veterinary assistant from DC. I asked her if she kept records or held animals. A little of both, she says. She's on her way to Stockholm. The young man in the window seat, also American, Black hair not combed any time in recent memory. <laughs> Expensive Italian shirt, gold crucifix fastened to his earlobe, scarab tattooed in the soft skin between thumb and forefinger of his left hand, so he's apparently interested in being seen, is reading a Portuguese phrase book, a lover perhaps in Lisbon or Faro. There should be a phrase for this sensation of passenger tenderness the flickering perceptions like the white caps you'll see later on the Neva when the wind off the Gulf of Finland roughens the surface of the river and spills the small petals of white lilacs on the gray stone of the embankment. Above it, two black-faced gulls tilted in the air cry out sharply and sharply, which reminds me of Mort's poem, I wrote that, I wrote that. <laughs> My wife, we run in Tilden Park and near Berkeley where there are a lot of black-headed grosbeaks and my wife has a poem about the black-headed grosbeak song, beak song, which is brief career, brief career. <laughs> and, and she liked that so well she thought that we should start a new literary movement called Spoken Bird. <laughs> So any of you who want to work on your spoken bird poems in the spirit of... This is a, a one-line poem. They are built like exclamation points, woodpeckers. <coughs> and this is after Coleridge and Formiwosh, late July, 
Coleridge uh, wrote one of his best known poems when uh, he was living in the Lake Country near Wordsworth and he had a terrific crush on Wordsworth's fiance sister. And the two girls had come to walk with William and Dorothy in the mountains and Charles Lamb had come up from London and poor Coleridge, is sort of typical of his luck, got a sudden case of gout and couldn't walk with them and wrote a poem a sitting at home imagining their walk called This Lime Tree Bower My Prison. So this is after college for me, was late July. I didn't go hiking with the others this morning. On the dusty trail past the firehouse, past the massive asymmetrical vanilla scented Jeffrey pine, among the spikes of buckbrush and the spicy sage and the gray green sea anothis. Listening to David's description of the terrifying efficiencies of a high mountain ecosystem, the white first cost benefit analysis of the usefulness of its lower limbs, <laughs> the ants herding aphids, they store the sugars in the aphids rich excretions on the soft green maces of a mule ear leaf. I think of the old man's dark study jammed with books in seven languages as the headquarters of his military campaign against nothingness. I thought his example was to stay home and work. There's immense egoism in it, of course, the narcissism of some wound, but actual making, actual work. One of the things he believed was that our poems could be better than our motives. So who cares why he wrote those lines about the hairstyle of his piano teacher in Vilno in the 1920s, or the building with spumy Baroque cornices that collapsed on her in 1942? David and the others would by now have reached the waterfall. There were things he could not have known as he sat beside her on the mahogany bench. They could have only seen or recomposed, remembering the smell of her powder as a 65-year-old man on another continent, looking out a small window at an early spring rain, that if she taught piano, she'd been an artistic girl, that she didn't have family money or she wouldn't have been teaching piano, that she must have dreamed once of performing and discovered the limits of her gift, and that her hair wound about her beautifully shaped skull, which the boy with his worn sheaf of Chopin etudes would hardly have noticed, was formed by some bohemian elegance and raffishness in the style of her music student youth, so that he, the poet at the outer edges of middle age, with what comes after that visible before him, could think unbidden of her reddish bell epoch hair and its powdery faint odor of apricot that he had not noticed and of the hours she must have spent thousands in a lifetime tending to her braids and think that the young himself then with his duties and resentments are always walking past some already perished dream of stylishness or beauty that survives or half survives in the familiar and therefore tedious, therefore anonymous outfitting of one's elders. And that her gentility would have required the rain in green California may have led up a little and quieted to dripping in the ferns required the smallest rooms in the most expensive quarter of the city she could manage. And this was why he visited her in that gleaming parlor room on the street of St. Peter of the Rock, and why he would hear years later in a letter from a classmate, the stone that crushed her was not concrete or the local limestone, but pure chunks of white, carefully quarried Carrera marble. Something in him identified must have with the darkness he thought his life as a writer contended against. He must have known that he was partly a child practicing holding its breath as a form of power, a threat, but against whom, to extort what? that he was a lover perfecting a version of the silent treatment from strategy, from some, from some strategy of anticipatory anger at the failure of love. 
So he may have had to rouse himself against himself, against the waste and wasted pathos and cruelty and vast stupidity to hear the music in which to say that he'd noticed after all the years that her small body had been crushed expensively. One summer, by that waterfall, I saw a hummingbird, a calliope, hovering and glistening above the water spray and the hemlock, then dropping down into it and rising and wobbling and beating its fur furious wings and dropping again and rising and glistening. The other should be there by now, and it's possible the bird is back this year. They'd have made their way down the dusty trail and over the ledge of granite to the creek's edge and to that cascade of spray. So my August notebook, um, thank you. I started to write August poems and my um, younger brother died. So the first set is called August Notebook of Death. And the title of the first poem is River Bicycle Peony, and it comes from a, the journals of uh, C.D. Wright, the poet C.D. Wright, who wrote in a journal, sometime a poet just wants to say river, bicycle, peony. <laughs> and the beginning of this poem is, um, uh, is, is typographical errors in it, and I have to sound it out for you. I woke up thinking a boy in my brother's body that, that was my first bit of early morning typing. So the first dignity, it turns out, is to get the spelling right. I woke up thinking about my brother's body. Apparently, it's at the medical examiner's morgue. I found myself wondering whether he was naked yet and whose job it was to take clothes off and when they did it seemed unnecessary to undress his body until they performed the exam, and that's going to happen later this morning. And so I found myself hoping that he was dressed still, though smell may be an issue, or hygiene. When the police do a forced entry for the purpose of a welfare check, and the deceased person is alone, the body goes to the medical examiner's morgue in the section for those deaths in which no evidence of foul play is involved, so the examination for cause of death is fairly routine. Two policemen, for some reason I imagine they were young, found my brother. His body was in the bed, which was a mattress on the floor. He was lying on his back, according to Angela, my brother's friend who lives nearby, and is schizophrenic and always introduced herself as my brother's personal assistant. And he seemed peaceful, she said. There would have been nothing in the room but the mattress and a microwave, an ashtray, I suppose, cartons and food wrappers he hadn't thrown away in the little plastic prescription bottles that he referred to as his scripts. They, must have, they, the police, must have called the medical examiner's ambulance, and that was probably a team of three. So it took five people to find and remove the body. When I woke, I visualized this narrative, and I thought it would be shorter. I thought that what would represent my feelings would be the absence of metaphor. But then, at the third line, I discovered that I could do this poem in a three-line stanza and that it was going to be the second dignity. So I imagine he is in one of those aluminum cubicles I've seen in the movies, dressed or not. I also imagine that if they undressed him and perhaps washed his body or gave it an alcohol rub to disinfect it, that this was the job of some immigrant from a hot, poor country. Anyway, he is dressed in this stanza which mimics the terza rima of Dante's comedy and is a form Wallace Stevens liked to use and also my dear friend Robert and anyway seemed peaceful is a metaphor. And the second poem is called Sudden and Grateful Memory of Mississippi John Hurt. Because I woke again thinking of my brother's body 
and why anyone would care in some future that poetry addresses how a body is transferred from the medical examiner's office, which is organized by local government and issues a certificate establishing that the person in question is in fact dead and names the cause or causes, to the mortuary or cremation society, most of which are privately owned businesses and run for profit, and until recently tended to be family businesses, with skills and decorums passed from father to son, and often quite ethnically specific in a country like ours made from crossers of borders, as if in the intimacy of death, some tribal shame or squeamishness or sense of propriety asserted itself so that the Irish buried the Irish, and the Italians the Italians. In the South, in the early years of the last century, it was the one business in which a black person could grow wealthy and pass on a trade and a modicum of independence to his children. I know this because Judith wrote, my friend Judith wrote a piece about it for which she interviewed fourth generation African American morticians in Oakland whose grandfathers and great grandfathers had buried the dead in cotton towns on the Delta and along the Brazos River in Texas, passing on to their children who had gone west in order of doing things and symbolic forms of courtesy for the bereaved and sequences of behavior at wakes and funerals so that, for example, the eldest woman in the maternal line entered the chapel first, and what prayers were said, and in what order. During Prohibition, they even sold the white lightning to the men who were allowed to slip outside and take a nip and talk about the dead while the cries and gospel song voice contralto moans of grief that could sound like curious elation rose inside. Also the rules for burial or burning, griefs and rituals and inside them cosmologies. And I thought of Mississippi John Hurt's great song about Lewis Collins and its terrible tenderness, which can't be reproduced here because so much of it is in the picking of the six string guitar and in his sweet, reedy old man's voice. And when they heard, he sang, that Lewis was dead, all the women dressed in red. The angels laid him away. They laid him six feet under the clay. The angels laid him away. You can fall a long way in sunlight. You can fall a long way in the rain. The ones who don't take the old white horse, take the morning train. When you go down into the city of the dead with its whitewashed walls and winding alleys and avenues of autumnal lindens and the heavy bells tolling by the sea, crowds appear in all directions, having left their benches and tiered plazas laying aside their occupations of reverie and gossip and the memory of breathing, to hear what scraps of news they can from this world, where the air is thin at high altitudes and smells of pine, and of almost perfect density in the valleys where trees on summer afternoon sometimes throw violet shadows across sidewalks. Only the arborist in the park never stirs for the new arrivals. He is not incurious, but he has his work. It's he who decides which limbs get lopped off in the city of the dead. You can fall a long way in sunlight. You can fall a long way in the rain. The ones who don't take the old white horse take the evening train. Last poem. Today, his body is consigned to the flames, and I begin to understand why people would want to carry a body to the river's edge and build a platform of wood and burn it in the wind and scatter the ashes in the river, as if to say, take him, fire. Take him, air, and river, take him. Downstream, downstream. 
watch the ashes disappear in the fast water or in a small flaring of anger, turn away, walk back toward the markets and the hum of life, not quite saying to yourself there, the hell with it, it's done. I said to him once, when he'd gotten into some scrape or other, you know, you have the impulse control of a ferret. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I don't know what a ferret is. I know I get greedy. I don't mean to, but I get greedy. An old grubber's beard, going gray, wheelchair, sweats, a street person's baseball cap. I've been thinking about Billie Holiday, he said. You know, if she were around now, she'd be nothing. You know what I mean? Hip hop? Never. See, she had to be born at a time when they were writing the kind of songs and people were listening to the kind of songs. She was great at singing. And I would say, you just got evicted from your apartment, you can't walk, and you have no money, so I don't want to talk to you about Billie Holiday right now, <laughs> okay? And he would say, you know, I'm like mom. I mean, she really had a genius for denial, don't you think? And the thing is, you know, she was a pretty happy person. And I would say she was not a happy person. She was panicky, crippled by guilt at her drinking. She was evasive with herself about herself as a result. And so she couldn't actually connect with anybody. And her only defense was to be chronically cheerful. And he would say, worse things than cheerful. <laughs> Well, I am through with those arguments, except in my head, and not through, I see, with the habit. I thought, I thought this poem would end downriver, downriver, with the habit of worrying about where you are and how you're doing. So I think that Mort should have... I think Martin Marcus should have the last word. These are the last two poems in the dark figure in the doorway. So this is for you, Martin. He, he, I'm sure he's bitterly disappointed not to be here. <laughs> so let's hope, let's hope he is. What is alive in us? What is alive in us, what vibrates in our animal skins is a harp string that's never still, a harp string turn to the drone of silence. It is the single thread, the radiant filament that sews us to our coat of darkness, the umbilical that holds us to the planet. Each of us is, yet allows us to wander among the stars, the guy rope that secures us to ourselves, yet lets us venture into the darkness all the way to the planet of someone else. Last poem in this book all we can do. All we can do on this earth is step into the future with a sense of the many people behind us, the living and the dead, as if we carried our bodies like amphorae filled with sunbeams into each new day, continually searching, reaching inside ourselves to scatter golden butterflies across the landscape before us or to fling them against the night, not like tears, but like stars that will guide those who follow us across the darkness. Thank you, Mort. Thank you, Jana, Donna, Valerie. Thank you all.